Good morning. This is Ryan Bast of the Motor Safety Association conducting a webinar for ergonomics for agricultural dealerships. I'd like to thank John Schmeiser and uh, Marty Cobb, uh, John of uh, Quida and Marty Cobb, the Executive Director of the Motor Safety Association, for having the vision to work together on these projects where we can provide quarterly webinars uh, to the members of Quida through our uh, membership program. Throughout the course of the presentation, I'm going to offer um, some options for people to uh, be able to speak out and enter information in the chat box, or they can uh, just speak uh, how they normally would through the microphone system, just depending on the disturbance or background noise that we have. In the past, when we've done some of these webinars, we've had some issues with background noise, so we'll just kind of see how it goes and mute and unmute the uh, speakers as needed if they're causing a bit of background noise for us this morning. A little bit about myself, I was uh, born in southeast Saskatchewan, came from a small farm out that way. I'm married right now and have a three-year-old daughter and a 10-month-old son. Um, <coughs> Back at my hometown, I was involved with the first responder program, as as well as I worked at the local John Deere dealership uh, for 13 years. And some of my roles I had there, I was uh, doing washing equipment, uh, detailing equipment, uh, setting up equipment, uh, working in the service department somewhat, uh, working in the parts department. I eventually, I worked my way to having my journey person certificate in parts management. So after my time at John Deere, I ended up going over to SIAST, where I completed the Occupational Health and Safety Practitioner Program. That's kind of where I really got my first formal training in safety. Even though when I was at the John Deere dealership, I was on the safety committee, uh, when I went to SIAST, I ended up getting formal training and my applied certificate in Occupational Health and Safety. Upon completion of that, I spent a bit of time at Brandt Agricultural Products as the parts coordinator and now I'm with the Motor Safety Association. So that's just a little bit about me and how I got uh, here today. The Motor Safety Association, we are a non-profit, non-government group. We work in Saskatchewan with any business that sells or services anything with a motor and wheels and a steering wheel. So that would be all the farm dealerships, the car dealerships, the heavy truck dealers, the auto body shops, the tire dealers, the gas bars, and towing companies. There's about 4,000 companies that we work with and help them with safety services in Saskatchewan. Our goal is we partnered uh, with Quida to provide quarterly webinars, but a lot of this will depend on the dealerships and you folks, the attendees, to let us know if there is any feedback or if there's certain topics that you guys wish to discuss through future webinars we do these presentations for you so your involvement and being able to let us know which webinars you want and what are some safety issues within your dealership will help personalize these presentations so you guys get the utmost out of them it's also a good opportunity for networking amongst uh, safety coordinators or safety committees amongst the provinces that are members of Quida. I feel that there is no borders in safety and we should really be sharing as much information as we can because we all are all working towards the same goal. Uh, there is another company called BDC and BDC have partnered with Quida in, in, in a an opportunity in providing the safety programs and safety information services as well. So the folks at BDC would offer uh, similar services that we do, uh, except that they would offer them uh, to all the Prairie Provinces where we um, would offer uh, just due to, to Saskatchewan. Uh, the services that we do offer to Saskatchewan farm dealerships come at no additional cost. So we can provide uh, those services for those dealerships at uh, no additional uh, fees to them. Uh, today's agenda, we'll talk a bit about ergonomics in the workplace, give you guys an introduction. I, I don't want to make you an ergonomist in an hour or less, but we want to give you just enough information to be dangerous so you have a good taste or flavor of what ergonomics is and some things you can watch for in the dealership. We'll talk a little bit about musculoskeletal injuries, vibration and some of its effects in the workplace. We'll look at some ergonomic improvements. We'll discuss some safe lifting techniques and wrap up with a little bit about office ergonomics. 
So in the last five years, uh, the Saskatchewan farm dealerships have had just about 6,000 days lost due to back injuries and just over 3,000 days lost to shoulder injuries. Both of these are primarily due to ergonomics. So when we have injuries to our back and shoulders, a good indicator is those would come from an ergonomic concern. So I do not have the stats for the other prairie provinces, but I'm similar. I'm going to guess that the results would be very similar amongst the other provinces with these numbers and trends pointing to ergonomics being a, a concern in the uh, farm dealerships. So what exactly is ergonomics? I like to think of ergonomics as working smarter but not harder. Ergonomics is essentially designing the job to fit the worker or the work to fit the worker. And this can be done by the workstation, having it fit the worker so that they're not overreaching or their setup is efficient so that they're not moving every direction in order to work within their station. By having everything uh, located in an area where they can access it, it's going to be uh, very efficient for them. Ergonomics is essentially, too, thinking outside of the box. Sometimes there are different ways to do similar tasks. So by knowing, having a good ergonomics program, you're able to look at some of these different processes minimize the risk of becoming injured, and get the job done more efficiently. A good example of this would be the Toyota automotive car assembly plants. Some time ago, they were uh, experiencing wrist injuries on their production line. So they took a closer look as to where this was happening. And it was happening in the assembly line where the people were installing windshield wipers on the cars. So they took a look at the process and see that when they're installing the windshield wiper, they have to reach all the way ahead and turn their wrist at an awkward angle. So if they do that repeatedly all day, reach, stretch, turn their wrist over all the cars and all the windshield wipers, they would run into the potential of an injury as what was happening at Toyota. So Toyota looked at the process and the design, and they changed the angle of that mount for the windshield wiper. So therefore, they were able to have people installing the wipers, and they didn't have to bend their wrist at an awkward angle. They were able to come in straight and turn it on. So that was just a change that they made, which was quite effective to them. Some of the benefits of ergonomics, as you could see by what I just spoke with with the Toyota company, was they decreased absenteeism. They didn't have that turnover of people leaving the dealership, retraining them on how they were able to do this uh, work in the assembly line. They didn't have those hiring and rehiring costs, and they decreased their injuries and accidents. So could you just imagine what kind of bottleneck that would cause an assembly line if all the same people are off work on an injury, and then they have to rotate, and they'd be short-staffed, and the productivity would, would really uh, tumble as well. So those are some of the things that we can look at and be aware of when we see these things within the dealership. So when you guys look at this here photo, what exactly do you see? Well, what this originally designed it was for as being a motorcycle stand. But I've seen this used in farm dealerships to help remove and replace clutches from tractors. So once they have the tractor split, you wheel this in there, and you can set that clutch right on there on the stand, and you can move it out or move it back in uh, when you're reassembling the tractor. So that's really effective, and not, not having people stoop, reach, lift in, and pull out that clutch assembly and replace it. So a tool like this, I could see it having many applications in the dealership to help reduce uh, some of those potentials of injury. Working at the correct height is something that really ties into a good ergonomics program. You can see the person on the left has stooped posture. Look at how he's bent over and reaching to work on the assembly line. Opposed to the person on the right, by adding an adjustable cart or table platform, he's able to work at a comfortable height where he's not bending like the first person on the left is, his back is straight, and he's able to be more productive, more efficient, and more effective. 
So those are some of the things that good ergonomics can keep people uh, more productive as well and prevent an injury from happening. So when you're starting to roll out your ergonomics program, a good first spot to start is a discomfort survey. In a discomfort survey, what it does, it allows staff to give you input and feedback as to what areas of the body they are experiencing discomfort. So they would, you would hand out this survey and they would shade in on this chart the areas that are bothering them. So if someone was to shade in, if you had 10 people shade in right shoulders as an area of discomfort, that might be a good spot for you guys to look at in the dealership. Why are they all experiencing discomfort in their right shoulder? What is uh, the root cause of that? So by being able to identify an issue of discomfort before it becomes an injury, you're going to be really successful in your prevention effort, efforts. Another key factor is having that staff input, having your staff give you the information and having the leadership support uh, those concerns are really true indicators of a good safety management system by having good leadership and supervisory uh, mentorship and coaching in the dealership, as well as uh, the staff's input are really successful in um, identifying a lot of these concerns. Uh, so these rooms, um, these discomfort surveys, I do have available. If uh, you wish to uh, obtain a copy of them, I do have those available. Uh, the next um, item that you could utilize is called a RULA, standing for Rapid Upper Limb Assessment. And this is really a quantitative tool used to assess a job process when you're observing a worker. And what this does is it, it allows you to put an, an actual number on a task by rating it as to what the risk is of an ergonomic injury. Because you might think that one task is riskier than another, but without actually scoring it, you may be quite surprised at what the results are. For example, if I use uh, this RULA assessment tool to on the process of removing a concave, so I would score, I would look at the numbers, and I could use it to score the process, and then I would determine that it, this would be uh, of high risk. I, w I would see that this would be a, a something that is in high risk. And we do have those rule of forms available as well. If um, you wish to do that, I would have a copy of that. So conducting an ergonomic assessment can really be broken down into four simple steps. What you need to do is observe that process. And let's use this for removing concaves, as I spoke of in the earlier slide. So if I look at every step in the process of removing a concave from a combine, and I write those down on a piece of paper, and of course I'm going to want to involve the workers, the people who are actually doing this, getting them involved in the process, because this stuff just can't come from me or you as a safety coordinator or a committee member. We need the workers' involvement in, in identifying these steps and processes. So once we have all these steps itemized, we're going to look at each step along the way, working left to right, and determine what is the ergonomic risk factor. Is this low, medium, or high? And value that. Put a, a rating on it. <coughs> and then once you're done this assessment, you can kind of determine which step in that process poses the highest ergonomic risk. So that's something that um, people can utilize as well to determine the uh, the proper way of doing an assessment. So once the assessment is done and we've seen maybe step four and six pose the highest ergonomic concern, we would look there first on how we can control that. We would obviously try and control every step along the way to minimize the risk of an ergonomic injury, but by looking at the areas of highest concern, we can really see how we can change that process to make it safer. Uh, once again, for our Saskatchewan uh, dealerships, we can come out at no additional cost and perform these ergonomic assessments for you. And I, I challenge uh, the dealerships in Saskatchewan as well as the other member in provinces of Quita uh, to let us know, to type in the chat box if there are concerns within the dealership of ergonomics. 
because we are always up to the challenge of trying to minimize those risks and come up with an assessment and to help you guys in preventing those ergonomic injuries. Some of the other factors that we consider is how much force is needed, let's say, to pull that concave from the combine. What kind of posture am I in when I'm trying to remove it and, or replace it? As well as the repetition, how many concaves are in this combine? How many combines am I working on that day? All those factors in to the, the worker's demand in that process. How about vibration? Is, 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 do I have any exposure to vibration via impact wrenches or other tools when I'm doing that task? Those are some things we look for. In addition, we, we look at the environmental surroundings. What are the light levels like? Is the temperature uncomfortable? What's the air quality? A lot of these environmental factors also play a role in an ergonomic assessment because they can all be contributing factors to the how much demand is involved and the surrounding conditions would all very much play a role in the ease of work and that process while that worker is trying to obtain and completion of that task. We also look at the workstation and the workstation layout. I like to think about how, what if, um, let's use the example of a shipping receiving department. And what if I kept the tape gun 10 steps that way, the uh, shipping labels four steps over here, boxes three steps behind me. So I'd be constantly walking in circles all day, back and forth, packing up my orders. And now just when you think about this, if it takes me, if I spend an extra 30 seconds on each box by the time I get the box, get the label, get the tape gun, put those items back, and I multiply that by how many boxes I do in a day, by a week, by a month. Look at all that lost time. So sometimes we say, oh, we're so busy at the dealership, we need extra help. Maybe sometimes by looking at our processes and becoming the utmost efficient, we can get more done in a day, and we could save those extra miles that we're walking. With safety and ergonomics really ties a lot into efficiency and the lean program by just uh, having things set up efficiently. And worker station layout is an area too that you could really minimize some of those risks uh, as discussed because sometimes you can keep those items that you're working with at a comfortable area so you're not bending to, to get those batteries or lifting them over your head to take them off the shelf because that's where you store them. So just by taking a closer look at your design and how things are set up, the weight of the objects that you're using, the height, and and how they're balanced. So maybe some of the tools that you're using may not be balanced for your hand or for your body. So an example is an impact wrench. The ones, like, I've seen the ones that have just a single trigger or they have a, a, a trigger the whole length of the grip of the handle. So by utilizing a full grip handle trigger system mechanism, it's a lot easier on your body's amount of force. It's spread out over four fingers opposed to all just on one. So those are some of the other factors that we look at in tools, layout and machinery, and the weight and height of objects, and just setting up things in our workstation the utmost efficient as possible. Musculoskeletal injuries, also referred to as MSIs, these are aggravated and caused by poor ergonomics. Some of the things that are contributing factors are those repetitive motions, the forceful exertions, the push-pull, uh, vibration absorbed through the body, other ergonomic stressors. All of these things contribute to an MSI, which is a disorder in your muscles or ligaments and bones, similar to a carpal tunnel syndrome, Some, these can be very painful, an MSI injury, and you really want to do your utmost to avoid them. Some of the early signs could be numbness, tingling or pain, burning, swelling, red skin or weakness. All these things could be real contributing factors to an MSI injury. But being safety people, how can we prevent that an MSI from occurring? Well, by ensuring adequate rest and recovery periods or breaks really helps give the body a chance to heal and utilize different muscles. I'm not saying everybody stop and take more coffee breaks during the course of a day, but get up and stretch. 
if you're sitting at an office workstation for, for every minute of the day, your body isn't made to sit. It's meant to get up and move. So go and uh, grab that paper from the photocopier. Get up, uh, do a stretch break. Keep your muscles moving because it's, they, like I said, your body isn't made to, to be in that stagnant position. A good opportunity in the farm dealership is, say if I'm uh, completing a work order on a combine and I've got 20 different segments, well, maybe I can split that work up and do some of the stuff with a higher physical demand first and split it up and do something, a lighter duty task and allow my body time to repair by utilizing a job rotation on that same work order. Uh, you're still getting your job done and you're going to be a lot better on your body. Keep in mind, your body is self-repairing, and it, it does repair itself. When you stretch your muscles, they stretch back into, into place how they normally were. But if you overdo it, you cause that damage to your tiss tissues and muscles, which, like taking a piece of paper and tearing it a little more and a little more till eventually it's ripped through and it can't repair itself. A good example would be if you go out to the gym for a workout, and a good workout feels good on your body, but if you overdo it where you tear that muscle and tissue beyond repair, that's not so good for your body. Another factor that we often think about is vibration. And there hasn't really been a lot of formal studies complete, completed on vibration, but what it does is vibration leads to the breakdown of these tissues in your body. It's caused by shock and absorption in your muscles, which deteriorate over time and can be harmful. So there's a few different kinds of vibration. There's the whole body vibration, which, say, I'm, I'm driving my old uh, tractor from the 70s on my square baler, and the vibration from the PTO coming into the this old cab where I could just see my levers rattling, my steering wheel just uh, humming away and buzzing, and my seat just bouncing up and down vibrating, that would be examples of my whole body being exposed to vibration. Then there's localized vibration, which could be absorbed through just local parts of your body, say uh, if you're to your hand by using a power tool or impact. So those are some different things that um, play a factor in vibration. Some of these effects can be pain to your back or your chest. You can have nausea, loss of balance, uh, damage to your discs. Trigger finger, where your finger eventually stays in the shape of a trigger and turns an odd color, like an odd, uh, where something that is not natural to be. Because if you're constantly exposed to triggering uh, by dirt and tools, that vibration is absorbed in your finger and causes permanent damage. So everyone has different levels of sensitivity to vibration. I know of an individual who had a new, or I should say an old computer on their desk, and the fan on it was out of balance, and this thing was humming and buzzing. And the vibration that that came through the desk to the person at that workstation they were exposed to this vibration level, which was causing nausea. So everybody has different levels of tolerance when it comes to vibration. One of the studies or discussions that our group at Motor Safety Association had regarding vibration is we recently teamed up with another partnering body and performed a case study where we looked at the effects of vibration. Uh, particularly, we took half-inch impact wrenches, we measured that vibration with a tool. And we could see the vibration level was very high for the operator. So then we, we used a control. We used the Zorbethane foam wrap. And this here foam wrap is used, we wrap it around the handles of the impact, cover it with hockey tape, and once that's in place, we are able to minimize that vibration to the operator. So we did assess it after this control was in place and the vibration was greatly minimized and reduced so that it wasn't harmful to the worker at the levels previously before this control was put into place. So here's a very low cost method to reduce some of the vibration in your workplace. And 
I was involved with this case study a year after the fact when we went and did some post uh, follow-up at some of the places that utilize this wrap. So after a year of this tool being exposed to oil, dirt, grease, and other contaminants, the, vibe, the foam had broke down somewhat, but it was still somewhat effective. So these... Um, this is a very affordable control you can use in your dealership to make your tools a lot comfortable to use and it does last. So I'm going to focus a little bit now on some ergonomic improvements at the dealerships that we've seen in the last uh, through our assessments. These could be uh, different hoists, different lifting devices or carts, uh, different uh, dolly systems, things that we've seen that uh, you might find helpful. So we'll just touch on those and hopefully you get some ideas that you can take home out of this. Uh, in the March 22nd, 2012 edition of the Western Producer, uh, the Case Company featured an article where it was featured about ergonomics and productivity when they designed the cabs on their case tractors. Their exact quote was, if we build these machines right, then farmers can work longer and more productivity with less lost time due to injuries and stress. So they identified that worker comfort and having these controls set up properly is going to reduce injuries. And Kyle Dooley of CNH, Case New Holland, said when they did this, looked at this process, they, they looked a lot to the military and utilized their research in the design of military equipment. Because military operators are expected to perform at high levels for long periods of time. So they, they tried to make these designs as friendly as possible and your exertion level minimized. So what they did was, on the hydraulics, they switched one example as they went to a rotary knob opposed to a sliding lever switch. So just by, by a different way of just redesigning their cab and making it more friendly for the operator, uh, their goal was to make it more comfortable and the person able to operate that machine for a longer period of time in the safer without having an injury. So that was a great initiative uh, that they recognized and took on in their design of these cabs for the tractors. How about uh, February 16th, 2012 in the Western Producer? Uh, this was a farmer who didn't like carrying his bags of canola seed to the top of his air cart. And by carrying those bags of seed, he could go up the staircase, lift them to the top, open the lid, dump the bags in, and it takes a lot of bags of canola seed to, to fill those air carts for how many uh, acres you're seeding of that product. So he plumbed into his existing hydraulic system on his air cart and came up with a hydraulic elevator where he can load these bags of seed onto the elevator platform and it'll lift it right up to the top so he can just uh, load it into the air cart. So I'm not going to comment about his uh, stooped posture and lifting technique, but uh, you know when I look at the whole process of being able to get these bags up to the top, along the, each step in the ergonomic assessment, we would itemize that, that as one of the riskier portions of that assignment. So by breaking it down into this method, he'd be able to get those bags of canola up uh, in the safest fashion. And this was actually was featured on the Prairie Farm Report too, uh, I think just in the fall of 2012, this product is featured. Another study, this one a little closer to home, involved uh, some of us, the staff at Motor Safety Association, and a, a local John Deere dealership where we teamed up and identified different ways to remove concaves from combines. So how we got to this process starting is, we looked at our stats and we seen farm equipment dealerships were having a high number of ergonomic injuries as I indicated in the one of the earlier slides in the presentation. So when we had that in, into place, we were able to look at the whole process of this task and see that removing concaves is an area that people could have the potential of an injury in. So we looked at how can we do that safer, or how can we do that differently. And by teaming up with the dealership and some of the assignments, the way we looked at the task was we came up with an electric winch system, a swiveling snatch block, and a sling, which allows us to 
lift that concave out of the combine, bring it down to ground level, and lift it up to replace it back into the combine. So that was a great way of getting the uh, the job done, where people were not having to take that lift, pulling it out, walk down the platform, as well as take it from the ground and carry it back up. So that would be um, an example of an ergonomic uh, control we did. We do have the case study on our website, and the uh, the clip on the Prairie Farm Report as well, where that was featured on our website as well, for future review if you're interested in, in checking that out. So here's a scissor lift cart. When we looked at uh, some of the previous slides about what these can be used for, I like people to, as I mentioned, think outside of the box. There's a lot of different applications you can utilize this cart for. Uh, one of them being you could, as I mentioned, it's adjustable. You could use this for a lot of different applications. But as we look deeper into it, I look at what about this handle? Now, is this at a good height where I'm not underreaching or overreaching to access it? Is the handle angle bent enough that these wheels aren't going to dig into my heels when I'm pulling it? Or how much push-pull force is required to get this scissor lift cart moving? Or what about the wheels and the surface that they're rolling on? How much uh, force is required? And with these surfaces, sometimes by changing the wheels on a cart, greatly reduces the amount of force needed to move them to get the uh, momentum going. So those are some other factors you could get used to consider when you're looking at some of these things. Here's a couple of tools that would have been very handy in the dealerships. These are a power pusher and a power puller. And I could just imagine the many things you could use this these tools for. Say if I have a clutch, a tractor split to pulling the clutch out of it or doing some work to uh, to it when it's split, when we used to set those tractors together, we would push on the wheels or the axle and we would manually slide these tools, these uh, components back to hook them up again. So I could sure see how one, a power pusher could be quite helpful in nudging the pieces of equipment back together or pushing stuff around in the shop. I could just see these this being such a good thing to have. Same with this power tugger. You could hook your the drawbar of an implement on and you can walk it into an area where you may not be able to back it in with a tractor and uh, a lot of different things you could do with something like this opposed to pushing or pulling it or different tasks. So if you, if you had either of these things in the dealership, I'm sure you could think of many, many uses where uh, you'd be able to uh, make use of them and they would pay for themselves, especially if you were to, weren't to cause an injury to somebody and you think of those costs associated and the absenteeism and um, if you have a technician that's off work with a back injury, how much that costs your dealership and lost productivity as well. So by having these tools in place and making the task easier for your staff is very effective in uh, a good ergonomics program. How about moving barrels of oil? I know when I used to sell 205 liters barrels of oil, I would walk and roll the barrels to the door. And, you, you know, you do that for a few customers a few times a day. That's a lot of uh, exertion for moving these barrels of oil, which can cause injuries to your body. Something like this would have been handy. This uh, powered cart, you, you can hook the sling onto your barrel, lift it up, and move it to the door so you can load it on the customer's truck or trailer. Or you could use them even in your warehouse. You might be able to arrange your barrels neater or stack your barrels. I could see something like this being used for other applications, and uh, I'm sure you folks could probably think of a few other th things that you could utilize something like this for in your dealership. How about ergonomic tools? Keep in mind, when companies advertise something as ergonomic, that is ergonomic for the largest percentile of the population. So what may be ergonomic for me may not be ergonomic for yourself. Just a good factor to think about is when you're buying these tools is the length of the handle. Are the, the two prongs of the handle going to dig into the midpoint of your palm? Your handle should really extend past the, your palm so that the, the end force isn't applied right into your hand, into your palm. 
So everything fits people differently. So just don't assume that because it's an ergonomic tool, it's going to be the best suited for you. The same thing goes for wrenches, uh, ergonomic wrenches. And I've actually seen where people have implemented a control where they've put a piece of rubber hose or a rubber gripping on the handle of the wrench because if the, let's use the example of this place was installing sections and guards on cutter bars. So this was kind of pre-impact wrench days where they were utilizing this. So they ended up putting rubber hose over that wrench handle to uh, reduce the amount of digging that does into the palm of their hand. So that was something they did that didn't cost anything. They made it a lot comfortable as well as, uh, as I mentioned, using an electric impact or air impact would be another control that you could use to minimize that risk. These are quite helpful, anti-fatigue mats. If you spend a lot of time standing at the dealership or you put on a lot of miles walking, these would be quite helpful because you can use these to really cushion your steps when you're walking with these shoe cushions or if you're standing to reduce the impact on your body that's absorbed in through your lower joints and your feet. So I've used both of these products and they are quite comfortable and helpful. There are some limitations if you are going outside or in wet conditions. These are something that you may want to be aware of because um, sometimes the design for these tools and applications may not be permitted for all season. So uh, they are kind of an indoor uh, use for both of these uh, items mentioned. How about these sit-stand stools? Anyone ever use these in their dealerships? Uh, the great thing about these is they're adjustable, so you can set the height and look at the angle. This keeps your hips open and your body aligned opposed to traditional bar counter stools where your hips are closed and it forces a bit of exertion force on your lower back. So this keeps your body aligned and straight. And uh, I can see a lot of parts departments utilizing something like this because they are quite comfortable. How about the, the picture on the right? Uh, these people are all working at the same height. So opposed to spending money on different adjustable platforms so people are working at a comfortable level, they added this here control by adding a little step stool to stand on. So that's, that's a great uh, low cost way of making that workstation more comfortable. One thing I have seen at dealerships which isn't the greatest is a lot of technicians standing on milk crates. These milk crates weren't designed to support their weight. They are lightweight, however, but do, there are a lot of other small stools that you can use that uh, will support your weight and are safe as well. I want you guys to take a close look and think about this slide. When we talk about ergonomic improvements, don't just assume the tool or product you're using is designed the best and it's safest for you to use. And the example of this is, what about a knife? If I'm using this knife, look at the, my wrist is bent at 90 degrees to hook onto that knife to use it. Why don't they make the handles like this? By using a pistol grip, uh, bending at a certain degree, or an upright handle, my wrist is in more of a neutral, natural position, and that reduces the risk of developing an injury. So I just want you guys to think about that. There may be some other tools that uh, you can utilize or look at how they are and how that fits your body. If you go on the internet and type in uh, ergonomic tools, you'll see some of these different designs where people have thought of different ways to do these tasks by minimizing an injury. How about it in your uh, bidding system at your dealership? So if you have a bunch of let's say, knife guards in a bin, and you get to the bottom of the bin, you're reaching to pull it out. This is a repetitive task because there's lots of guards that you, you sell at a time possibly. But what if you had a, one of those bins with a spring-loaded bottom so that it gradually raised that load out of your bin so you could just reach it? I could see this being effective on fast-moving parts. As your bin empties, the bottom raises so you're not reaching into the bin. If that's not in your budget, how about something like this? This will cost you next to nothing by taking your inventory bin and tilting it. 
This promotes the gradual flow of parts to the lowest area in the bin, so people can just reach in and grab those parts out, opposed to the individual on the left who's stooping in to try and pull those items out of the bin. So there's something you could take home today with you. It's not going to cost you a lot of money. Just by simply tilting your bin, just look at the, between the two pictures. I know I'd sooner be taking out of the second bin than the first bin. I'm going to focus a little bit on some safe lifting techniques. And as mentioned, the individual who was lifting those bags of canola seed, how his back was stooped and bent. Well, over time, that's going to catch up to him, and he's going to have some back problems. So that's, that's an example of lifting something the wrong way. This is how you want to lift something the right way. Approach that box. Think about what you're lifting. Hug the load. Keep your back straight and your knees bent. Lift straight up by keeping your back straight and using your leg muscles. It's amazing how strong your leg muscles are, and when you lift properly, how effective you can lift. And you're going to want to repeat that process when you're setting the object down. So lift things properly is very important. You can see by this diagram uh, the zones when you're lifting. Obviously, if you keep something closer to you, it's going to be a lot safer if you keep it uh, in that green zone. The further out you get, the more risk it is to you. So when you're lifting items, you want to also consider the weight of the object, uh, the stability of it, how many times you're lifting it in a day, what, what kind of handles there are, if any. And those are things to think about. So if I'm, an example is if I'm lifting, a, if a customer brings in a starter core and it's in an oversized box, so I go to lift that starter core box and the box starter rolls ahead, well that causes a nudge or a jolt. So by knowing what I'm lifting, I can plan for that and I can lift that the safest possible way because sometimes uh, you don't know what's inside those boxes and everybody has a different idea. I was in a, a classroom setting and we passed around a box. Everybody lifted the same box and we took a piece of paper and we wrote down on it what we thought it weighed. Not one person had the same amount and it wasn't even close. We had anywhere from 20 to 45 pounds on the same box in the same classroom. So sometimes by knowing the weight of the object, everybody has a different idea. But by accurately knowing what you're lifting, uh, sometimes some of the manufacturing companies, when you may get a, an item, it'll say the weight right on it. So that would be quite helpful as well. I'm going to focus a little bit on office ergonomics. Uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know John Schmeiser of Quida, here's a picture of John sitting at his uh, workstation in his office. No, I'm just kidding, John. This is uh, just an example of, a, you could say, an extreme case of an ergonomic improvement where this is actually something available where a person has in place um, in their workstation as something that they can utilize. This is obviously a dated picture looking at the monitor and uh, computer, but um, it, this is something that uh, people have used. When you Google ergonomic uh, improvements or tools, you'll see some of these uh, devices. How about this? With conventional keyboards, when people have their palms flat, they are higher exposed to carpal tunnel syndrome by that contact stress between their wrists and the keyboard when they turn their palms flat, how they do on uh, conventional keyboards. What if they use something like this, where the keyboard sides are turned up, and this keeps their wrists in the natural position, and it's neutral because they're not turning them. So they're touch typing. So this greatly reduces carpal tunnel syndrome, as well as what's kind of neat is, look on the top, these rows of uh, these mirrors that allows you to see the top row of keys. This is pretty neat. So this is just someone thinking about they weren't happy with the original design of the equipment and they changed it to make it safer for the operator. How about mouses for mousing? Everybody uses a different style of mouse that may fit them better. So also keep in mind when you see something advertised as an ergonomic mouse, which both of these two are on the diagram, it may not be ergonomic for you, but it may be for may fit me. Like I'm a left-handed person, so I may prefer a different style of mouse than what you prefer.
so by t thinking about these things when you buy them, just to be sure that you get something that fits you. A, a good set of advice when it comes to mousing is just to alternate. So you're not always using the same hand for when you're mousing at your workstation. So you're always reaching with the same hand. By rotating that mouse, you're minimizing the amount of force and the amount of overstretching that you do every day to utilize that uh, mouse. How about your workstation when you're setting it up? When you're setting up your workstation, you want to make sure that your keyboard and mouse are just slightly below your elbow height. This here picture is okay, but what would make it better is if they had a keyboard tray that would uh, just uh, attach to below their station so you can adjust the height of that keyboard tray. Or I've seen the ones that also have the swiveling mouse tray. So everything is attached and you can adjust that height so it's right for you because this desk height might not be right for this person. So by setting things, uh, having an adjustable workstation for a keyboard tray or mouse tray, it's going to really be helpful in setting that up so it's uh, most fitting for you and the highest possible way of reducing that ergonomic injury from developing. What about some features for an ergonomic chair? You don't need to spend a lot of money when you buy a chair just because it's ergonomic. Really, an ergonomic chair needs to be adjustable. So you need to be able to make adjustments so that chair can fit you. You're going to also want it to have a rounded waterfall front uh, that's just uh, below your knees, where your knees and your legs touch the chair just inside your knees. That area needs to be rounded. You're going to want to have five wheels, not the, the old chairs with four that were tippy, and you like it to swivel and move around. So those are the hugest requirements. They need to be adjustable for sure. So let's give you a few quick and dirty steps to uh, adjust your office chair. So the first thing you want to do is set your seat height. And by looking at this picture, what you want to do is you want to set the top height of your chair platform just below the kneecaps. So if you stand up in front of your chair, that's should dig into just below your kneecaps. So that's a good starting point as to where you want your chair height set up. Next, when you're sitting on your chair, you want to keep your feet flat. So you may have to tweak that height adjustment from the previous slide, but it should be pretty close uh, based on that previous uh, setting. Then you're going to want to sit on your chair while keeping your feet flat on the floor. Clench your fists and put them between the edge of your seat on the lower part and behind your knees, you're going to want a bit of a gap there. You don't want that, con that contact stress of the chair digging into that portion of your body. That's where that rounded waterfall comes in on your chair. Once you have that setting properly lined up, you're going to want to adjust the backrest so it fits the lumbar support of your back. So if you reach back and grab the, the wing nut or make that adjustment or have someone do it for you, slide that back support up so it fits into the natural curve of your back. So it's in the most natural position and it fits your back. Once you have that in place, you're going to want to keep the backrest tilted. And by tilting that backrest, you want you don't want your chair at 90 degrees. You want it at least 100 or 110 degrees. By tilting your chair backwards slightly, it, it keeps the, the body flowing naturally, and it's better for the, the S-curve and the, the, the shape of your body. Another adjustment you, you could also do is the, the base, sliding this back and forth. That would have been uh, from the previous slide to ensure adequate uh, space between uh, the rounded waterfall portion and behind your knees. So there are many adjustments you can do on your chair to make it fit you in your workstation. So take the time to, to do it and set it up properly. So that uh, wraps up our ergonomic uh, webinar today for agricultural dealerships. I invite you to tune back in again on April 18th, and we're going to talk about inspections investigations. How do I complete an inspection? What are the steps of conducting a proper investigation in the workplace? If you require a copy of this presentation for your reference, you can contact uh, the good folks at QUIDA 
or you can contact myself at the email address provided below, rbast at motorsafety.ca, and I can get you a copy. And if you could take the opportunity, when I sent out the initial invitation for the webinar, to complete the feedback, the feedback helps us improve. We like to make these presentations the best experience for you. So by you being able to let us know what topics are safety concerns in your dealership, what are some things that you are experiencing that need help with in safety, let us know so we can tune that presentation for you in the future. Uh, with that, uh, that wraps up our ergonomic presentation. I hope I gave you guys some ideas that you can take home from this presentation. A lot of things with ergonomics don't require you to spend a lot of money. When we look at those examples of tilting the bin or having someone stand on a step stool that's adequate opposed to pl different platforms. But there are opportunities to spend some, some money as well if that's in your budget on some of these improvements. So if you do have any questions, I encourage you to call us anytime, as well as uh, you can email or check out our website. And like I said, we really encourage you to get involved by letting us know topics uh, that are interesting to you. So with that, I'd like to thank you for signing into our webinar this morning, and I definitely welcome you guys to attend and come back on for the April uh, 18th date for our next webinar. Thank you guys very much for your attendance today, and I look forward to uh, doing this again with you in April.